So in this unit, we talked on Friday about these functions. So living things, whether they are simple bacteria, complex trees or humans or um, squirrels or mushrooms, they all need to basically accomplish certain functions. They all need to obtain nutrients and distribute those nutrients throughout the organism. They need to get rid of dangerous waste materials. They need to respond to internal and external changes in their environment. They need to fight off invading foreign pathogens. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about each of those things and sort of compare them between a whole variety of organisms. How do plants do this? How do mushrooms accomplish this? How do humans accomplish this and so forth? So we'll sort of use different organisms as a representative to sort of compare how different types of living things accomplish each of these. So we'll start at the simplest organisms and then we'll build our way up to more complex. So we're talking about obtaining nutrients. So bacteria. So bacteria are really simple. They're a single cell. They don't even have any membrane-bound organelles. However, they do still need nutrients. They need to obtain energy and different materials from, uh, from their environment. So the way they do that is really simple. Those materials can diffuse right into them through the cell membrane. And if there are larger materials that need to be broken down, bacteria can accomplish digestion. But they do it by what we call extracellular digestion. They excrete enzymes out of, their, out of the cell. They break down large molecules outside of the cell into simpler molecules which they can then absorb. And we're gonna talk about it when we get to humans, but these bacteria are also extremely important in our own digestive system. We have trillions of bacteria that live within our digestive system that are really important to our health. Okay, they're called our gut flora or gut microbiota. Fungus, mushrooms, yeast, slime molds, things like that. Uh, these are mostly organisms we call saprophytes, meaning that they break down and consume dead organic matter. That's their main source of nutrition. You see some mushrooms growing out of the ground. They're living off of material that's in the soil that they can break down. In my house, we had an old a tree that we took down in our front yard, and every spring, a patch of mushrooms pops up in that same area because there's all the remnants of the roots of that tree were not removed, and so those mushrooms are there, and they're breaking it down year after year. That's what's going to be their source of nutrition. So they use extracellular digestion like the bacteria. Fungi have these, they're, they're not called roots, but they, you can imagine them as sort of roots. They're called hyphae, and they spread these around, and they exude these enzymes to break down organic matter, and then they absorb them into those hyphae. For example, bread mold is a fungus, and so these hyphae grow throughout the bread. When you see that it's like hairy, the mold on, the, on your bread, before, you're gonna throw it away. Those little hairy things are actually the fruiting bodies of that fungus. They break open and release spores, which float through the air and can land on other pieces of bread and, and help. that's how this fungus reproduces. Plants. Plants obtain nutrients. Obviously, they obtain um, material through photosynthesis. They can take <coughs> Uh, G3P and transform it into a variety of substances. They also they'll need some other things from the soil besides water. They need minerals. The three main uh, macronutrients you call them for plants are nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. 
And there's also some micronutrients they absorb, but those they absorb through the soil. And then they can transform those products into a whole variety of different materials. Protists, simple single celled organisms. We study them in seventh grade amoeba, paramecia, miglina. Uh, they need nutrients as well. However, they're only a single cell, so they don't have any body systems. An amoeba doesn't have a digestive system. Uh, they do this in different ways. Do you remember how the amoeba consumes material? Yeah, it engulfs it, sends the pseudopods oozing around it until it's engulfed. That's called phagocytosis. uses pseudopods to engulf its food. And then once it has engulfed a particle of food, then it's inside of it. It's in a food vacuum. They have lysosomes, that organelle we learned about back in cells, which contain digestive enzymes. Those lysosomes merge with a food vacuole and break down those nutrients. So here you see an, an amoeba that's engulfed the bacteria. It's then inside of it in a food vacuole. A lysosome merges with it, releases enzymes to break down this bacteria. The nutrients can be absorbed, and any other material that's no longer needed can just exit the cell through exocytosis. Paramecium is a little different. They don't have um, this flexible outer layer. They have a shell around them called a pellicle. So they have special um, parts that allow them to ingest food. They have a what we call an oral groove. It's sort of like their mouth that sort of ushers food down it using cilia. At the end of their gullet, kind of like their esophagus, a little food vacuole that's kind of like their stomach. And then the process is the same after that. The food vacuole can merge with lysosomes, can break down those materials, and then any uh, undigested material that's no longer needed leaves the paramecium through that anal pore. Moving on to animals, simple animals. At first, a hydra. This is a hydra, you look at them in seventh grade as well. Hydra have a single body opening in a single body cavity. They don't have a digestive tract with two openings like other animals do. So the hydra basically capture their prey. They have these stinging cells on their tentacles. If you've ever been stung by a jellyfish, you felt the sting of these um, special parts called nematocysts. This is what they look like. They open up and send this little arrow, a barb, into their prey, injecting a toxin, which is irritating to us and deadly to other small organisms. And that's how they immobilize their prey. They then use their tentacles to basically stuff the prey into their body. So here are this hydra's ingested in daphnia. The cells inside of the hydra produce enzymes to break it down. Anything that's undigestible then comes back out through the mouth. And nutrients are absorbed into these cells. <coughs> Earthworms, an annelid, has a digestive tract more like ours has two openings, a mouth and an anus. Food enters through the mouth, exits through the anus. So the earthworm, basically they ingest soil. As they dig their way through the soil, they're ingesting it through their mouth. It goes through their digestive tract, which is made up of various parts, an esophagus, gizzard, intestine, similar in some ways to ours. Along the way, that organic material is digested and then absorbed into their blood.
Anything undigested comes out the other end. Those are called earthworm castings. Probably when your kid, you saw them in your yard, you probably picked them up, squished them in your fingers, threw them at your brother or sister. Uh, really, it's earthworm excrement. It's earthworm poop, those little piles of stuff. Um, and they're actually good fertilizer for the soil. Earthworms are really important for the soil ecosystem. They tunnel through the soil, they aerate uh, for plant roots, they produce those castings, which are good fertilizer. You can actually buy earthworms from like Amazon. They send you a bag of earthworms, you can dump them in your garden. You can buy earthworm castings too, just a bunch of earthworm poop, throw it in your garden. <clears throat> All right, and finally it leaves us with humans. So we'll talk a little bit more extensively in each of these sections about human uh, systems for nutrition. So humans digest material through extracellular digestion. So the food is digested outside of our cells and then the products of that digestion are absorbed into the cells. Like earthworms, we have a one-way gastrointestinal tract, the mouth at the beginning and anus at the end. Nutrients move through, are digested and absorbed, different parts. Different parts are specialized, adapted to digest or absorb certain materials. And the digestive tract, the gastrointestinal tract, is made mainly of smooth muscle tissue. And the food moves through our digestive tract through this action we call peristalsis. This is the contraction of muscles one at a time from the top to bottom, squeezing the food along the digestive tract, kind of like squeezing toothpaste out of a tube. Start at one end, and as you squeeze, you force it out. That's how our digestive tract moves food along. Um, typically, it only moves in one direction, but it can move the opposite way. Okay, when a person vomits, it's reverse peristalsis. The muscles start at the bottom and contract at the top, forcing <coughs> the contents of the stomach out through the mouth. <clears throat> so digestion begins in the mouth, or sometimes called the oral cavity. What's in our mouth that starts di chemical digestion? All right? Saliva. So saliva it's not just water, it's a mixture of enzymes and water and other things. <clears throat> and that saliva, the enzymes contained in it, help start the digestion of polysaccharides. Carbohydrates are what saliva begins to break down into disaccharides and monosaccharides. Chewing our food is what's called mechanical digestion. Basically take a large chunk of whatever, a Pop-Tart, and chewing it up into tiny little bits increases the surface area which the enzymes can then work on. So we have these salivary glands up in our, under our tongue, up in, inside of our sort of skull around our mouth. They squirt saliva into our mouth different times. If you're like hungry or if you smell food cooking or you think of some delicious piece of uh, popcorn chicken from school that you're going to eat for lunch today. Um, your brain, had, I don't know, I'm just making it up, sorry. Sorry to get you excited. Um, but when you start thinking about foods like that, that feeds back into your salivary glands and your mouth starts to water. Um, so that enzyme is called salivary amylase that's in our saliva. <coughs> from our oral cavity, as we swallow food, it goes through our esophagus, which is about a foot long or so. Peristalsis forces that food down through your esophagus until it sort of falls into the stomach. There's no digestion happening in the esophagus. It's basically just transports material. And then the food enters into the stomach. The stomach is sort of a pouch of muscle. and this is where um, protein digestion begins. The food stays in the stomach for a few hours, typically. 
and the fluid gets sort of mixed around with what we call gastric juices. Okay, this is hydrochloric acid and enzymes that break the food from these chunks that we swallow into a liquidy mixture we call chyme. Our stomach also releases hormones into our blood. There's this feedback between our digestive organs and our um, endocrine system. For example, if you eat something with high amounts of protein or fat, the stomach will produce hormones that encourage the release of enzymes to break down those materials. So some of those materials, gastric protease, which breaks down proteins, hydrochloric acid with a very low pH. Now that low pH could be damaging to most cells. However, in our stomach, we have a layer of mucus that protects our stomach lining from this acid. Sometimes it breaks down, though, and our stomach acid actually damages our stomach tissue. That's what we call an ulcer. If you've ever heard of somebody having an ulcer, it means there's damage to the lining of the stomach, and the acid is actually harming the stomach lining. There are muscles that, that keep things in the stomach and prevent material from moving uh, until it's ready. At the top of the stomach, between the esophagus and the stomach, is the cardiac sphincter. The sphincter is a, a ring-like muscle that can close down. Now typically it's closed so that the material from our stomach can't go into our esophagus. However, sometimes stomach acid does get into our esophagus. And that's what causes heartburn. So if you ever had heartburn, what causes that pain in your chest, it doesn't have anything to do with your heart, it's because stomach acid has moved into your esophagus and is irritating and damaging the lining of your esophagus. You could take an antacid like Tums, which is basically a base, and you chew up this base, swallow it, and it neutralizes the acid, causing the heartburn to go away. Over the long term, however, heartburn the stomach acid can damage the esophagus, can lead to more serious problems in the future. So if you have like chronic heartburn, like everyday heartburn or several times a week, then most people should probably be on a medication which reduces your stomach acid, so you don't always have to take an antacid. There's another sphincter at the end of the stomach that keeps the contents of the stomach inside until it's ready to move on. That's called the pyloric sphincter. All right, so from the stomach, here we have some pictures. Um, so again, you see here are main salivary glands that are located in our mouth. I don't know, have you ever been like reading a book and yawn and you get a little spray of saliva all over the book you're reading? Some people can like make their salivary glands like shoot out saliva on like command. I, I can't do it, but some people can just like lift up their tongue and they'll see a little spray of saliva just flying out. Yeah, I mean, usually it's inadvertent, so some people can voluntarily do it. Um, here are some examples of um, ulcers. This is a stomach ulcer in the duodenum. This is the beginning of the small intestine. You can see the damage that's been done to the lining. This is in the um, stomach. This is a gastric ulcer. So then from the stomach, the food, when it's ready, moves into the small intestine. The small intestine is actually pretty long, 18 to 23 feet long, coiled up in your abdomen. And the main function of the small intestine is to continue digestion of food and absorb the nutrients that have been uh, broken down from that digestive. So as the food travels through the small intestine, it is broken down by other enzymes. Protease breaks down proteins, lipases, which break down fats. Enzymes that digest disaccharides and other materials are excreted into the small intestine to digest that food. Also material called bile is produced in the liver. Bile's job is to emulsify fats, 
to break down fats. It's produced in our liver, sent to the gallbladder, and when we eat foods that have fat in it, our gallbladder then releases that bile into the small intestine. Okay. The bile is also basic, so it can help to neutralize the stomach acids. Because when the material from the stomach moves into the small intestine, it's quite acidic. So the bile, along with <clears throat> other material like sodium bicarbonate, neutralize it because the pH of the intestinal juices gets up above neutral to slightly basic. So the bile and sodium bicarbonate help neutralize that acid. As the food moves further through the small intestine after it's pretty much been fully digested, then those nutrients are absorbed. They're absorbed into our blood through our, our small intestine has these projections that uh, these finger like projections it's not smooth on the inside it has these bumps inside each of these are called villi our blood vessels where the nutrients we've digested can be absorbed into our blood to be transported throughout the body there's also lymphatic vessels in there that absorb fats there's capillaries and this blood that has now absorbed those nutrients can then get sent to the liver to be processed and then to the heart to be distributed throughout the body. After the small intestine comes the large intestine. It's a wider tube, but it's shorter, about four feet long. By the time food has reached the large intestine, all the digestion has taken place. Okay? Nothing is left. Most of the nutrients have been absorbed into the blood. The purpose of the large intestine basically is to reabsorb any excess water that's in that digested material to form feces. Feces is material that was unable to be digested in the digestive tract. If for some reason the large intestine removes too much of the water, it could lead to constipation, be treated, by drinking lots more water, drink, eating more fiber. Or if the large intestine has not absorbed enough water, that's what leads to diarrhea. There's too much water in the feces. That can lead to dehydration. There's also, like I said earlier, many bacteria. Thousands of species of bacteria live in our digestive tract. They change constantly. <coughs> depending on the food you eat, depending on where you live, the makeup of these gut microbes changes. Um, and so these bacteria have a mutualistic relationship with us. We provide them with nutrients. They provide us, in some cases, with different types of vitamins. Okay? Um, and if you've ever taken like a strong antibiotic for a long time, you may know it could sometimes lead to um, intestinal pain after a while because the antibiotic has killed off many of those helpful bacteria in our gut and therefore we don't quite digest the food the way we normally do. Like eating like probiotic foods, things like yogurts or other things like that, the, the idea behind that is to help reestablish your gut microbes if they've been damaged. Um, Feces is stored in the end of the large intestine, the rectum, until it's ready to be eliminated through the anus. There's also this little part of this large intestine, the appendix, this like little tail here. Uh, sometimes becomes infected in people, inflamed. When I was 12, I think, I got appendicitis. I had my appendix out. That can be removed pretty easily with simple surgery. Um, and scientists used to think it had no function. But actually, the appendix, they now believe, is like a storehouse for beneficial bacteria. So if your gut microbes are, are damaged in some way, they can sort of reestablish themselves by these um, microbes that are in the appendix. So I don't know, probably have your parents ever had to have a colonoscopy? Have you ever heard of this? You may, if they have, you may know. What do they have to do the night before? Uh, they, do or they have to take a, a strong laxative. Typically, they then spend the rest of the night in the bathroom. And they can, because the colonoscopy, they use a camera to look inside of the large intestine. They could go the other way from the mouth. Excuse the interruption. As 
at the end of the period when the bell rings, the following middle school varsity athletes should report to room 105. Boys varsity ice hockey, girls varsity ice hockey, boys varsity swim, boys... Oh. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about this uh, later tomorrow.